carry the presence of God and worship him in spirit and truth, that God will show his fullness of his glory in a tangible way that we've never understood before. Let's look at Moses. Just the same, same chapter, but verse 9 and 10. You see here, Moses, you know, um, God will show up in this thick cloud and, you know, and nothing and no one can penetrate. That was a manifestation of God's glory in fullness. And it brought revelation, uh, re reverential um, awe and worship before him. So it's not something sensual. You know, people look for, look for you know, some kind of sensual you know, thing to happen in church. It's not about being sensual. It's about worship. It's about awe before God. Let's look at that first. Verse 9. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent. And the Lord would talk to Moses. And the people, all the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the door, the tent of Moses. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man at his tent door. You know, I've heard of, uh, you know, I think Pastor Noah was the recent one who told, uh, told us about how in one church meeting, the glory of God came down in a cloud. It was so thick that the person sitting next to each other could not see each other. And people wondering what's happening, trying to get into the tent. But because the cloud of God's glory was so great, they could not go in. That is the full manifestation of the glory and presence of God. What are we looking for every Sunday? Now, before we start pointing fingers at the worship leader or the pastor, you know, or the worship leader or the pastor pointing fingers at the congregation, you know, uh, it's because of you, you know, we didn't have the fullness and presence of God. Maybe we should ask ourselves first, individually, are we caring? presence of God? Are we staying in the presence of God? If not, we are the very hindrances to the fullness of the manifestation of the glory and the presence of God. That is why we must get our attitude right before we get into the sanctuary. The sanctuary is not a marketplace where you can haggle the price. It's not a shopping mall. It's not an eating place that you can be careless and carefree. The sanctuary is hallowed before God. On Thursday night when I walk in, I, ooh, I just don't walk into God's sanctuary like this. I walk in with fear because this is holy ground. Our attitudes Coming to church today, many of us show we have hardly know how to respect the presence of God. I'm sorry for saying that because I was like that before until God began to cause that revelation, reverential fear on me. You know, I met an Australian uh, man many years ago in a zoo. You know, I believe God connects people for specific purpose. And he was an elderly man, and he was um, so, I don't know how we end up sitting at the same table. Um, so he asked me what I do. So I told him, you know, uh, what I do. And he was so excited. And so um, he began to share how, how recently he was so grieved by the disrespectfulness of people in that particular charismatic church he attended. And after a while, he regretfully, he decided to go back to the Anglican church where he grew up in. And he knew that by going there, he's not gonna get you know, food. It's dry. But don't get me wrong, okay? Not Anglican, not all Anglican church are dry. 
I know of some Anglican church, they are on fire, where the full manifestation and glory of God is so strong that what we see here is nothing. So be careful how you begin to despise Anglican church or the conservative church because God is doing a new thing Amen. among them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In fact, many charismatic churches, full gospel, whatever you call it, Pentecostal church are so dead now. Why? Because there's no presence of God anymore. So don't be so proud that we are full gospel. Full, full gospel? Really? There's no presence of God? Hmm. You know, so he continued to tell me about how the things, you know, yeah, I said, but why? Why? I couldn't understand. He said, well, he said to me, he said, yeah, they are, they are pretty dead in that particular church. But he said to me, he said, at least the people who come into that church know how to respect the dead, figuratively speaking. Because he said they are solemn. They know how to be solemn and respectful in church. He said, at least I go there, I can really meditate on God, if nothing else. I can, I can begin to meditate and know the presence of God. That's sad. You see, the Holy Spirit is like a dove. It is very gentle and it will easily leave when it finds no place to rest. That's why I was crying out to the Holy Spirit, please stay, please stay. Stay and sit upon us. Just try and go to a pigeon. You know it will fly away if you try to disturb it. Just get closer, it will fly. And the Holy Spirit is like this. It will hover around. And that's when we think we know the presence of God. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit is hovering around. But there's a difference about have, knowing the presence of God around you and the presence of God upon you. Big difference. Many times we get so happy. Oh yeah, the presence of God, we're so happy. But we forget that there was an, there's another level. We wait until the Holy Spirit sits upon us. Verse 17 of uh, Exodus chapter 33. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have asked. If you have found favor loving kindness and mercy in my sight, and I know you personally and by name. When we know and we have and we stay in the presence of God, God knows us in an intimate way and he knows our name. Well, of course he knows everybody's name, but whether he know you intimately by your name, because there is a scripture that says, you know, God, I, you know, I do this, I did this, I do, and then Jesus said, I never knew you. Jesus didn't know him intimately. It was just his service. Service without intimacy with God is not really intimacy. God don't want us to be acquaintances. Many Christians are acquaintances. When we know him personally and he knows us in an intimate way, we gain favor. We gain his loving kindness and we gain his mercy. Back to Psalms 91 verse 14 to 16. Verse 14 says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name, has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love, and kindness, trusts and relies on me, knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. 
He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. All these benefits when you stay in the presence of God. Now, you, many of us have received his loving kindness, okay, and his favor. Not because we are staying in his presence, but because he's a covenant God. He shows us mercy and grace. But do not take for that for granted because it will come to an end. This is a warning. You see, the Israelites enjoyed that. But when they continued to stay out of the presence of God and despise his presence through murmurings, you know, idolatries and rebellion, all those came to a stop. We don't want that to happen. So God is saying, come. And stay in my presence. That's why this message is important. He wants to continue to bless you. He wants to continue to deliver you, to protect you. But you need to come to his presence. Get into another level of staying in a presence with him. You know, as long as our own presence in any situation as circumstances and plans exceeds the presence of God, we are not staying in the presence of God. We are staying in our, in our own presence. When we are when our own presence supersedes God's presence, then we are still in the position in where in the dark chambers of our hearts we secretly say and breathe, I did it. I did it with pride and self-exaltation. As long as there is a tinge of darkness, Remaining in our secret chambers, we are vulnerable for a great fall. The tinge of darkness that remains in our secret chambers puts us out of the lingering presence of God. When we are outside the presence of God, we are outside the boundaries of God. When we are outside the boundaries of God, then we are vulnerable for the fiery darts of the enemy to attack us. Think about all the difficult situations you are in today, the chaos, the unrest, the confusion, the grief, the anxieties, the strivings in our homes. How much of it is because we have not stayed in the presence of God? How much in the secret chambers of our heart, our own presence has superseded the presence of God. When we choose to do things our way, we have superseded the presence of God. When we desire things that are not in the perfect will of God, no matter how good it is, no matter what, how good people see it is, we have superseded the presence of God and exalted our own presence. You know, many such exaltation happen in ministry, not just in personal life, or family life, or work life. For example, in church service, okay? Although it is wise for us to plan for ministry, because God clearly is a God of order. That's why, you know, we have the creation. It was chaotic, but God put things into order. But there are times in a service, God wants to do something out of the order that we plan for. 
When I teach like this, some people get angry with me. You know, we always pray before we plan, and you tell me that God changed his mind? <laughs> Think about that. Now, I give you a question consider. Consider this. If God is truly the sovereign God, can he have the right to change his mind? God usually will change his mind per se if there is someone in the service crying out to him for a touch in his life that he desperately needs. You see, Jesus honored the order of the service, but when he saw somebody having a need, a desperate need, Jesus will change the order and broke the protocol and minister to that person so that that person can receive the divine touch of God. Every service is about people being touched and transformed by the presence of God. God is always about touching people and bringing transformation and wholeness in their lives. I do not know the real reason why you come to church, you know. But if the real reason you come to church, it's not about seeking the presence of God and to be transformed by his presence and his word. You are exalting yourself above the presence of God. You may think this is so hard. But these are the things that God rebuked me for along the way in my walk with him. He rebuked me on all these things that today I'm giving to you. You know, people, there are many reasons why people get exigated, but you know, I'm gonna give one, one example here. You know, they get agitated and upset when the order of service is broken, when the worship gets too long. How many people today felt so uncomfortable? And I got up and I started singing and singing and singing and singing. How many of you were so like, oh, we're just going to stop? You know, even some pastors get concerned when the worship is too long. You know why? Because they think, man, that worship is so long, I don't get to preach the sermon that I work so hard on. <laughs> Come on, pastors. Wherever you are, I'm going to speak to you in YouTube. <laughs> preach that sermon another time. Give God his time today. <laughs> and some, some, some of some deacons, some elders, some pastors also, they think, oh, man. If it goes too long, we don't have time to collect offering and tithe. <laughs> That's real, eh? <laughs> if people love God, you don't even need to take an offering. They will give it. I have members in my church when they know they cannot be church on sa uh, in Saturday because they do work, you know. Um, we have a lot of my members don't work this, the regular time that, you know, most of you do, you know. They would give the offering on Thursday. I didn't ask for a collection. They gave because they love God. Getting a collection is not pay payment for the church time. Why do we insult God? Like, if we don't collect offering today, oh, we'll be short about, you know, paying for utilities and all. But this is God's ministry. If the people of God love him, they will give regardless. You see, offering and tithe is actually a love offering to God. Out of your heart, it is a worship. 
It's not like going around collecting tickets, you know. I don't, it's just a, a totally different, uh, you know, scenario here. And there is another reason why people can get so impatient. You know, that you said, okay, the service is from this time to this time, and they look at the time. You're not there yet, and then they g they give this look to the pastor. The people speaking. <laughs> they show all kinds of sign, you know. They, they try to force you to end, and sometimes you get so distracted in your message, you, 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 you forget what you're supposed to say. <laughs> they're impatient because they, maybe they're hungry and they have other plans. You know, when people and pastors and elders and deacons, whatever ministry you are in, acting like that, it is actually about their presence, not God's anymore. Hello. The service is about not about keeping to the strict order of men, okay? Where people go to church because of an obligation and duty. Church service is not a club. It's, it's very disturbing when you hear people in the world say, oh, you know, they have this club in the, in the church. I said, what? What club? They were talking about all the different ministries. You know, you go there, you have this uh, fun thing with the youth, and, and they do this and this and this, and they call it a club. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, have we sung so low, trying to be relevant to the world? That is a bad impression. I don't deny that we need to attract people to the church. I don't deny that. But if, if you send a wrong signal to the world, how can they respect the presence of God in the church anymore? It's just a club. The place... The, the church is the place where we learn to stay in the presence of God and carry the presence of God throughout the week. It is a place where we learn to move from glory to glory, being transformed on the inside by his word and, and increasing in the presence a little bit more every church service. It is a place where we are mindful of other people's needs. When the order has to be changed because God wants to minister to a particular person in the church, we need to be flexible and loving enough to let God change the order for that particular person. It may be a death and life situation. You know, if, if everything is about us, me, my needs, my family needs, it's exalting our presence more than God's presence. You see, if we adults don't know how to stay in the presence of God, our children, our teenagers will not learn to stay in the presence of God. If adults do not, you know, if adults just, you know, exalt their own presence over God's presence, then our children, our teenagers will not respect the presence of God, will not want to stay in the presence of God. You can send them to Sunday school, Bible study, retreat. It will amass knowledge, but without experiential knowledge, uh, with the work of God in their lives and the presence of God, it is just knowledge. And that's when death comes in. If you wonder why your teenager doesn't care, ask yourself, how much are you caring the presence of God? Don't, don't call them rebellious. Start with yourself. Why are they rebellious? Why don't they want anything to do with what you have? Is, is God real? Maybe you're just facts. Maybe you, you can quote scriptures and, and, and all these things. I was there. I remember my son's. Gideon, poor Gideon, <laughs> not, not here to defend himself. Um, he would tell me one time, we were doing family time, Ma, I don't want to do this anymore. <coughs> I was so upset, 
so hurt. That was many years ago. And then he began to tell me the reason why. I realized it's me. I need to make a change. I need to make a change. And I did. And today we enjoy our family time together. Amen. I make the change. So be think before you start scolding your, your teenagers, your young people. Think about yourself first. I'm sure the teenagers right now in this room are saying, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, well, you can be happy today. <laughs> um, you see, if, if the logos remains a logos and does not become a rhema, it is just it's just facts. It's no more experiential. It is not the revelation of God. Staying in God's presence includes allowing the knowledge of Him becomes an experience in our lives. That's staying in the presence of God. See, the presence of God are many. Okay? Many. You have already seen. There are many and there are unlimited and continual. The, the benefits of our own making in our own presence are limited and not continual because we don't know what a future holds. God is the Alpha and Omega. We just sang that. Alpha and Omega. He knows our end. He knows our end from the beginning. But we don't know our end from the beginning. And we have all this exalting of our own presence, carrying our lives without him. <coughs> hmm. So my challenge today for all of us is this. Will we stay in the presence of God so that the full manifestation of his glorious presence will be evidenced in our daily life and every service? You know, our church, English service is so small. Not even a quarter of you guys. Not even a quarter. But why do these people keep coming back? I was thinking, by now they should all have left. But the very thing that keeps saying to me, the presence of God is so real. And their lives have been transformed. Everyone who have stayed so long, every one of them have testified how their lives have been transformed by the presence of God, by the word of God. And that, to me, is glorious. I have come to a point where I'm not worried about numbers anymore because suddenly I realize what God is saying to me. It is about people who know the presence of God, ready to be transformed to do his purposes. <coughs> so will we allow God's presence to increase in our lives? Just as the desire of Pastor Somi, he wants the church to rise up to another level of walking in the presence of God. and move from glory to glory. Sometimes we can take, you know, our own pastors for granted because we become so familiar with him. We know, we know his weaknesses, his wife weaknesses, his children weaknesses. I'm kidding. <laughs> but we must understand that we are all progressing. Even pastors are progressing. If we understand the presence of God and the transformation of life, we will give everyone a benefit of a doubt. If God wants to move people out, it's his problem. We need to love. Amen? Let's pray.
Begin to ask God to do that work inside of you today. Let, let 